Unlike, you know, I was, for a long time, I was chairman of the board of sponsors of the Bolton, the Atomic Scientists. We do the Doomsday Clock. And w when I came in as that, we broadened it from just nuclear. It was, it was, it stud the Doomsday Clock was about existential threats to humanity. Okay. And it was created by Oppenheimer and Einstein in 1947. I was very happy now, then to be the chair of it after all that time. Because but every year, Oppenheimer, after he was involved in the Manhattan Project, at, yeah, after he was involved, came back and said, yeah. this is bad. Well, so a, a lot of the scientists from the Manhattan Project came and said, we have to explain to the world the da dangers of nuclear weapons so that we don't have nuclear wars. And that was, and the Doomsday Clock was designed to be a symbol that would present how close to midnight we were based on, okay. on, on nuclear tensions. And okay. so for 10 or 12 years while I was doing it, we'd set the Doomsday Clock every year. But we expanded it to include other existential threats, one of which was climate change. Okay. But at the same time, it's apples and oranges. Nuclear weapons are a huge threat. They remain so today. And tomorrow, the world in many ways could be dramatically changed if there was a nuclear... Uh, 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 yeah, John uh, McNamara so always said, that's how we're gonna go. Well, I don't know, you know, I don't... He just I, said it was one of the biggest It's dangers. certainly the biggest, it is the biggest existen immediate existential threat. And, um, and, there are way, and the point is there are ways to go, let me just, as long as we're talking <laughs> disasters, um, Obviously, a global thermonuclear war is boom, oh, world's over. Okay, we already hit, we, even though we've reduced the number of thermonuclear weapons, we still have f at least five thousand in the United States, five thousand in Russia. That's more than enough to do in the world. But, but forget that for the moment, and, and forget the fact that, by the way, a lot of them are still on, on trigger alert. There's no need because we're not, you know, we, we at this point still we're, in, we're not on the, yet back in the Cold War. We don't need to do that anymore, but we do, and, and an accident. And we've come so hair trigger close to accidents over the last 50 years. Trigger alert means if one fires there, I'm going to yeah, fire yeah, and then Yeah, yeah, because you don't have go. enough time to assess. Right. And so the chain of command, you want to read, uh, there's, a, there's two really chilling books to read. One is Command and Control. Uh, and, but uh, Daniel um, Ellsberg, who released the Pentagon Papers, has written a book called The Doomsday Machine about his, not just the time when he was working for the Rand Corporation and security, all of the near nuclear not only nuclear threats, but when he discovered, for example, the, the, one of the myths is that it's only the president that can launch nuclear weapons. Well, that's a myth. And, and, uh, and one of the other myths that many Americans think is that the United States has a no first use policy of nuclear weapons. It doesn't. Never renounced, it never said we won't be the first to use nuclear weapons. I mean, it, there are lots of scary things there. But one of the scary things was the realization that a distant nuclear war between, say, India and Pakistan, which might involve 200 nuclear weapons or 100. Or recently, about 10 or 15 years ago, there was a, a physicist did a, a series of estimates of what would be the impact of a limited nuclear war. Obviously, India and and and, and uh, Pakistan would be devastated, but a limited nuclear war with maybe a 100 to 200 nuclear weapons exchange between those two countries, it would produce a global impact on the climate that would probably kill a billion people because it proves global warming. Now that's not, I mean, global cooling, now that's not the way we want to counter global warming. But, it, but the particulate material in the atmosphere would affect the global temperature in a way that would affect crops around the whole world for at least a decade. And so we, no country is an island. And I, and I brought up those nuclear threats to point out that we haven't even dealt with those. But as hard as it is to deal with nuclear threats, Dealing with climate change is harder because people keep thinking it's in the future and the way people do risk analysis. And as a business person, you're familiar, people don't think about risks in a rational way. And, if, and the way people do risk analysis is such that if it's, you know, if it's 50 years in the future, it's never worth dealing with it. And if, even if it's 10 years in the future, as far as people are concerned. And it is remarkable how people will be misplacing how they respond to risk. Um, I mean, the simple example is that I, you know, I, I do travel a lot, and and I and it I find it ridiculous the things I have to do to go through airports now, because of people's concerns about terrorism on planes. Now I understand it's a concern, but you know, some guy light tries to light a shoe and fire, and then people have to take off their shoes and 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 go through these things. And and I don't want to make it sound like I don't care about this, but let's just talk about it from a from a statistical, a statistical exactly right. a statistical perspective. Let's say we lost three planes a year to do. I mean, which is awful, okay. But compared to the number of people who die, say, in in, in mass shootings in the United States, it's nothing. 
but we won't act on it. But yet people, will, that threat and that fear is such because everyone flies um, and, and they assume they're not going to be involved in a mass shooting, you know, because it's not, it's, they, they occur in pockets here or there. The kind of things people will respond to and not respond to is very irrational. Uh, you know, lots of people, Danny Kahneman and others have written about this, and the, 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 that our perceptions of how, of how we assess risk and how we're going to take actions are, are certainly not um, rational from a, from a, from a probabilistic perspective.